Thank you for listening to my talk today. Because I know that you'd all rather be having sex. <laughs> the average healthy person thinks about sex every day. Did you know that? One reason that men and women evolved and exist is to have sex. And we're not the only ones thinking about it. <laughs> But while you're lying in bed next to your partner, sweaty and exhausted, wrapped in red satin sheets, listening to Kenny G, <laughs> have you ever pondered why? Fundamentally, sex is how moms and dads contribute their genes to their offspring. So, for most of the 19,000 genes embedded in our chromosomes, we have two copies. One that we inherit from our mom, and one that we inherit from our dad. This is the recipe for life. But why does the recipe call for two helpings of most genes? One reason is that it's always good to have a backup. If one gene copy has a mutation, the other healthy copy can compensate. And we all have some intuition for this, because it's common knowledge that you shouldn't marry and have children with your sister or brother no matter how wonderful they may be. <laughs> People who are closely related share many of the same mutations in their genes, and so if they have kids together, the kids have a higher risk for having the same mutation in both copies. No healthy backup copy. And so they have a higher risk for developing a genetic disorder. So one reason that we have sex is to mix the genes from different and ideally unrelated individuals. But that's not the whole story. In the 1980s, scientists learned how to take all the fun out of making babies. <laughs> At least for mice. <laughs> When the sperm meets the egg, it forms a zygote that contains the set of genes you get from mom and the set of genes you get from dad. And the scientists were working in the lab, and they developed these tiny needles, and they went into the zygote, and they sucked out the genes that came from the dad, and they injected in a second copy of genes from mom. So the embryos effectively had two mothers, no father involved. And they also engineered the opposite situation, where they had embryos that had two sets of genes from dad and no mother involved. What do you think happened? They died. Even though they had the normal set of gene copies. Only embryos that were engineered with a set of gene copies from mom and a set of gene copies from dad generated mice that survived. And the experiment revealed that the genes we get from mom and dad are somehow different. They're not just backup copies for each other. The difference turned out to involve a special kind of gene in our genome called imprinted genes. Now, imprinted genes are distinguished by the fact that moms and dads stick chemical marks to them in the egg and the sperm. And those chemical marks are inherited by the kids, and they silence the genes in the kids. But moms and dads put those marks on different genes. And so, as a consequence, some genes silence the copy from dad and express the copy from mom in the kids. And other genes silence the copy from mom, but express the copy from dad. You may be deeply disturbed by the idea that your parents sent you secret messages that are stuck to your genes. <laughs> but I'm just getting started. The scientists again engineered cells with genes from 
two moms and cells with genes from two dads, and they mixed them together with normal cells so that the embryos would live longer, and what they discovered was amazing. The embryos with cells with two sets of genes from mom developed small bodies but very large brains. <laughs> and the embryos that were engineered with cells that, that had a set of genes from uh, only dads had the exact opposite phenotype. <laughs> they had large bodies and relatively small brains. <laughs> <laughs> So you may not be surprised by this. <laughs> but what it revealed is that the imprinted genes we get from mom and dad have very different effects on offspring brain and body development. So mom and dad, moms and dads send us different messages through these imprinted genes. But while imprinted genes are fascinating, they're also rare. Only about 1% of the 19,000 genes in our genome are imprinted. And the researchers in my lab were left with the question, what's the story with the other 99% of our genes? Do they have two copies just to have a backup? Is that the whole story? Is it time to roll over, turn out the light, and go to sleep? Not yet. And this part of the talk is complicated, but you know, it's not the Kama Sutra. <laughs> when the genes in our DNA are expressed, they make a molecule called RNA. RNA makes protein, and proteins build our cells. We can measure RNA. Sometimes, when our genes are activated, they make a lot of RNA. And sometimes they make just a little. Now imagine that we clone a whole bunch of nerds. <laughs> and we dissect out a piece of brain tissue from each nerd and measure the activity of the genes in that brain tissue. For a given gene, in some individuals, the activity level will be high. In others, it will be low. There will be just this natural variation across different individuals because of natural variation in their physiology and variation in how we dissected out that piece of tissue. But now we drill down to the level of the mom and dad's gene copies. And we expect that the two copies will go up and down together in their activity because they're just backup copies of one another, expressed and regulated in the exact same way. But what if we discover genes where that's not the case? And they express the two copies differently. Well, that would suggest that they're not just backup copies of each other, that maybe they're doing different things. So we did this experiment for each of the 19,000 genes in the genome in mice. And we found genes that express mom and dad's copy the same way. They were highly correlated, like this gene, as though they're acting as backup copies for each other. But we also discovered hundreds of genes where that was not the case, like this gene, Adora2b. When mom's copy increases its activity, dad's copy decreases its activity. They're negatively correlated, acting antagonistically to each other, clearly doing different things. And the story got even more interesting when we started to measure these things at different ages. In the adult brain, 10% of genes expressed mom and dad's gene copies differently. But in the developing newborn brain, over 85% of genes expressed the two copies differently. It was as though each gene copy had its own unique role to play in building the developing brain. Holy crap! 
There was no time left for sex. We had to like get into the lab and do some serious experiments. <laughs> because this could really change how we think about how our genes make us who we are. Over the past several decades, we have developed new technologies that can routinely sequence our genomes and analyze our genes. And we've learned a whole bunch of surprising things. We've learned that all of us have bona fide disease-causing mutations in our genome. About 400 damaging mutations on average. Two lethal mutations. But I feel fine. And you guys all look great. So for reasons that we don't fully understand, some of us get sick and some of us don't. The other thing that we've learned is that the mutations in our genes that influence our risk for disease are typically present in just one gene copy, not both. For example, paternal age has emerged as an important risk factor for a lot of different disorders, like autism. And one reason is that fathers are constantly generating new sperm, and they accumulate more and more mutations in the genes in the sperm as they get older and older about two new mutations per year. And those mutations are inherited by the kids in their dad's gene copies. The mom's copies should act as a backup, but we've just learned that in many cases, the mom and dad copies are expressed differently. So how does this actually play out? We wanted to know, and so we engineered mice with a mutated gene copy and a healthy gene copy, and we looked at how they're expressed in the brain cells of the lab mice. And we discovered cells that express both the healthy copy and the mutated copy, kind of like we expected, so there's a backup healthy copy there. But we also discovered cells that were only expressing the healthy copy which was very surprising. But more alarmingly, we found cells that only expressed the mutated gene copy. The cells that preferentially express mutated gene copies contribute to our risk for disease. If they do, this paints a very different picture of disease. But we don't know right now. It's just an idea. And there are a whole bunch of questions that remain. Most of what I've talked about, we did in lab mice. But you may be wondering what's happening in you. You may be wondering about how your parents' genes are expressed in you. And if you are a parent, then maybe you're thinking about how your genes are expressed in your kids. Maybe they have really annoying habits, like their father. And now you're thinking, they must express a lot of his gene copies. We also wanted to know the answer to this, and so we developed a staining method that we could use in post-mortem human brain tissue to look at the activity of the two copies we get from mom and dad. The staining method reveals the individual brain cells in blue, and it reveals the activity of the two copies of a gene in red. We can't tell which copy is mutated or healthy yet, and we can't, top, tell, we can't tell which one comes from mom and which one comes from dad. But we can see for each cell whether it's expressing both copies equally or differently. We found genes like this one that expresses both the mom and the dad's copy equally in human brain cells. So there's a backup copy there. But we also discovered genes like these ones. Huntington, which is linked to Huntington's disease, and a gene called DEF1 that's linked to autism. They are clearly expressing their two copies differently, and we found brain cells that have only one active gene copy. So like mice, we also frequently express our mom and dad's gene copies differently. 
And this means we may not fully understand why we have sex and contribute two copies of most genes to our kids. Research over the past several decades has taught us an incredible amount about how our genes make us who we are. And by gaining a deeper understanding of our genes, we're gaining a deeper understanding of disease. We're learning how to make better therapies, better medicines, but there are lots of mysteries that remain. We think that we've discovered something fundamentally new by studying the activity of our genes at the level of the two copies we get from mom and dad. And we were surprised to find that there are genes that we know cause disease in people that express their two copies differently. We found cells that frequently express mom and dad's copies differently, mutated and healthy gene copies differently. Why? Do these effects play some special role in shaping the function of our brain? Do they shape our risks for disease? We feel like explorers on the edge of a new frontier, and we're really excited to find out what we're going to learn. We may discover that your parents always have the last word. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>